on this journey of spiritual leadership and um, today's the stop and uh, rumbling with vulnerability. So I, I like to give everybody the heads up. So in case you want to make a quick exit, you can. <laughs> I know we all want to. <laughs> so um, I was thinking about the zillions of times in my life I felt vulnerable and I landed on one to share with you um, about when I was 22 and I was working at um, Ogilvy and Mather Public Relations. And it was my first time of giving a presentation. And in the room were my team members, and um, we were account execs, and the others were the creatives, which is so crazy. You know how we do that, that separating labeling thing. Um, and then there were you know, other um, supervisors and so on. But my primary supervisor was in the room. Her name was Leah. And I already had in my head, I was pretty new with this, but I had in my head this tape that Leah thinks I'm stupid because um, she said something about Goethe, the German philosopher, and I said, who's Goethe? And she was just aghast. I mean, like, what? How do you not know who Goethe is? You know, how sometimes people have that kind of reaction and then you internalize, oh my God, I should know her. You know, I went and read about it, you know, right away. <laughs> and at that time, it was a read about it, not a, you know, read about it. <laughs> And so anyway, so there I am in this moment. So I give my presentation. It's OK. You know, we're, I'm through it. I'm ready to sit down. I'm very anxious to sit down. It's like, whew, OK, got that over the first. You know, and then she asked what she had the gall to ask questions. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And I tell you, I was in such a I'm done. And, and like the armor is going up now, you know, <laughs> you know, you could just kind of feel it snapping into place that I could not mentally compute her question. I mean, I could not take it in. I was that armored up. I was that self-conscious. And so I had to ask her to repeat it like three times. And I just, I don't know what I, I said some flubby answer that made no sense for what her question was, I think, because, and finally I just slunk into my chair, you know. And here I was a communications major in <laughs> college, you know. So I had that to add to the whole thing that was going on in my head, right? But the point was that, you know, I, I felt so vulnerable. And, um, and we can't do anything with that except for either shut down and armor up or step in and embrace it. Had I had the skills, better skills that I have now to be able to go in at that moment to feel what was going on and to be with it and give it a little bit of comfort, I would have, could have been very much present with what the rest of what was going on there. But I just didn't know at the time. And that's how I knew how to deal with vulnerability. So <clears throat> fast forward eight years later, I'm in ministerial school. And I'm thinking, oh my god. Like, I got to speak all the time. <laughs> and people will look at me all the time. I think that was the worst part, you know? It's like, I just don't, you know, just don't look. Everybody turn around and I'll talk. <laughs> and, and, and to come up with something to say every week. It's like, how in the world do you do that? You know, week after week after week. And, and I saw people do it and they brought good stuff week after week after week. I mean, wise things, funny things, funny things. How could I be funny? You know, so it was just all of that spinning, you know. It's like, oh, well, maybe I'll figure out, you know, because God led me here and I just said yes and yes and yes and so now I'm sitting in the chair and it's like yikes you know what do I do with this and it turned out that as I practiced as I embraced those self-conscious and vulnerable feelings and I just kept putting myself up there and out there that I ended up loving it it was like my favorite aspect of ministry was speaking and so it's just it's so interesting how God does this to us. <laughs> and these, the, the call comes, right, of what we are to do. I mean, I didn't know back when I finally landed. I didn't know what I wanted to study. I finally landed on communications in school because it was the lesser of evils, I think. I just wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, you know. But when I look back, and I bet you too can do this, when you look back at your life, as my former minister Mike Matoin said, my 87 unrelated jobs, he could, you know, you can find a thread. And you, the thread is God. The thread is spirit. That's spirit calling you, even though it looks like a lot of detours. There's something in there that is about the trajectory of your soul. It's about the unique expression, the gift that you have to give. 
And so if we listen and if we are willing to move through those blocks, those emotional spaces that come up, those moments of vulnerability, and we're willing to be with it and have the courage, because that's what it is in the presence of vulnerability, it's courage, it's taking heart, that we are able then to move through and to get the, the juice, the divine magnificence that wants to be shown, right? The, the light and the love that wants to be exposed. So today we're gonna knock down six key myths of vulnerability that uh, Brene Brown uh, brings forth to us in her book, Dare to Lead. And it's important to know first how, um, the, what the foundational definition is that we're working with. So vulnerability, in her words, is the emotion that we experience when, during times of risk, uncertainty, and emotional exposure. Vulnerability is the emotion that we experience during times of risk, uncertainty, and emotional exposure. So it's that thing that is there for us that we are often quick to shut it up and close it in, right? Or hide or find the exit door or whatever it is or deflect in some way. So lots of ways, antics that we try to get around this, right? But God forbid we should feel it. That's kind of the, the bottom line here for us. So, so let's look at the six myths. So the first one is that vulnerability is weakness. Anybody ever think of vulnerability as weakness? I sure used to think of it that way. And so she's talking, Brene is talking, addressing 100 or so military troops in the Midwest, she said. And she says to them, now how many of you can give me a single example of courage amongst other soldiers that you've witnessed or your own life where there wasn't a feeling of vulnerability present? as she has defined vulnerability. She said it was total silence, like pin drop silence. Finally, one young man raised his hand. He said, no ma'am, three tours. It's not possible. Everything I've seen, he said, when it takes courage, it takes massive amounts of vulnerability to work through. That's the truth, right? So we can think it's weak, but that's just our ego trying to you know, dance around it. <laughs> the truth is, it's just, a, it's just a part of our experience along the way. It's uncomfortable, which is why we try to cover it up. But by its very nature, there is an uncomfortable experience there. The thing is, the more versed we get at this, the more ease we get with meeting up with these emotional blocks, the easier it becomes. Now, we might get bigger things coming along, but we're more practiced at it. And why do we want to do that? Again, because underneath whatever it is that we're blocking emotionally is the spirit. <laughs> so the emotions come up and they point the way for us. The emotions are the, the juice of our prayers, right? The emotions are also the blocks when they are in this realm of fear, discomfort, and so on. And so this first one, she gave, she also, Brene has spoken to all kinds of audiences of various groups. So, you know, corporate executives, CEOs, teachers, activists, artists, clergy, all kinds of groups. And she said she always asks that question and she always gets no response. Because <laughs> nobody can think of a single time where they have witnessed an act of courage where vulnerability hasn't been present. As Marianne Morrissey said, there's no successful person who succeeds in the absence of fear. It's the presence of fear that is a part of the success. It's a part of the process. It's a part of our success in unleashing the truth of who we are. The second myth is I don't do vulnerability. Yeah, lucky you. <laughs> or unlucky you, really. Because if you don't do vulnerability, then you have to be shut down. And it's actually really not possible not to do vulnerability. I mean, I guess it is if you just sort of live in a very safe, sort of contained, hidden kind of way. It might be somewhat possible some of the time to not do vulnerability. But essentially, something is going to come along sometime in your life. You're going to be in a hospital bed, or you're going to be next to somebody you love who's in a hospital bed, or somebody's going to break your heart, or you're going to love somebody who doesn't love you in the same way and says, you know, those famous words of, oh, I love you too, as a friend. <laughs> oh, 
you know, it's like, uh. <laughs> so there's that, you know, there's those moments, right, that we are definitely going to feel that, but we might have that, this myth, this idea, this belief that I don't do vulnerability. So I was um, in my kitchen one, one day with my friend Robin and her friend Catherine, and they started talking about this experience that they do at these retreats. And Catherine had been doing them for a long time, and they help people break through these boards. And I love that kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, cool, can I do it? She's like, yeah. So she runs to her car to get it, and we're standing in my kitchen, and she's telling me, okay, now you write on one side of the board what, you, what you're afraid of, and on the other side what you want to break through into what's like kind of your release statement and your affirmation. It's like an affirmative prayer right there in the, bo in the board, you know? And so, um, and then, you know, you just kind of get ready and you get yourself in the mindset of, of I can do this. And then you just, you know, give it a, give it a good karate chop. And so, so I'm, you know, it's this thick. The board is this thick. So, you know, you don't look at it and say, oh yeah, I'm going to just chop through that. No, no worries. Right. So I, but I'm thinking, I, you know, Catherine's, Robin's done it. Tons of people have done it in these seminars. I can do this. And so I'm all ready to go, and I get, you know, they're holding the board for me, and they're like, you can do it, and, ah, oh, that hurt. <laughs> like, a lot hurt, you know? So I was just kind of rubbing my hand, and, and, and my mind starts spinning, right? Because all these people have done it. And this is like a mind over matter thing. I mean, this is sort of like proving my worthiness as a spiritual being, you know? And now I'm in ministerial school, so there's all that stuff going too, that you're supposed to be, right? You're supposed to get it. You're supposed to be an example. So if I can't be the example and all these people are going to be in these seminars, you know, I can go, I can go, right? <laughs> I won't, I won't. <laughs> I won't bring you down that hole with me. So I get ready again, and, and it's like I'm coming from this real bravado kind of ego place, like, oh, I can do this, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, and it's about strength, right? So this is about this sort of athleticism and strength. So I'm coming from that, oh, oh that one actually just really hurt my hand. Just <laughs> I didn't really mean to hurt myself, but that, like, hit a nerve or something. <laughs> so, so, well, that's appropriate. So now I feel the hurt. <laughs> But, but it was going inside, right? Then I had to kind of pull back and go, okay, okay, what's going on? And it's there. It's there in that tender place that we find it, right? It's there that we find what blocks us. It's there that we find what stops us. In fact, I think I had on the other side, nothing stops me. Clearly something was stopping me, right? But it was here, not here. It has nothing to do with the physical. <coughs> You know, it has nothing to do with these are the outer representations of what it is that is possible in us. But it's this that was blocking. And so once I could get into, ah, oh, I see, I'm comparing, I'm afraid. I've got all these fears running about how I'm showing up or what I'm able to do. And so once I could embrace that, guess what? Like paper. I swear to, I swear to goodness, it was like paper. <laughs> It was nothing. It was like, boom, wow, that was so easy. I can't believe the board is broken. <laughs> it was that kind of feeling, right? And it's the same in our lives. It's the same in our emotional experiences. It's the same when vulnerability is present in whatever things that are up in our lives. If we can just dip into it, give it a little attention, recognize what's going on, <sighs> It's gone. Everything's opened up. The doors to our heart fly back open. We're ready to love. We're ready to give. We're ready to serve. We're ready to be who we have come to be. Our spiritual work is a lot more about removing blocks than anything else. You know, because it's already there. We're already it. We're already completely all that we have come to be. We just haven't realized it yet because we've set up all the, the, the obstacles. And vulnerability is, is a slapped onto every one of those obstacles. And so if we can just embrace it, allow it, be with it, recognize it, a universal human emotion, we all experience this. And the more we are called, every time we are called up to do something greater, it's going to be there. It's going to be present. And we're so, it becomes a friend after a while. 
Madeline Lengel, the children's author, said that we, when we're children, do you, do you know Madeline Lengel? Wrinkle in Time and a, a bunch of other classics. Somebody just said another one. Oh, okay. Okay. Talk to David. <laughs> I loved Wrinkle in Time growing up. So, um, so anyway, she says that, you know, when we're young, we think that getting to be a grown-up is, is that you grow up out of your vulnerability, right? <laughs> Don't you think that when you're a kid? You think, wow, they're so, like, I remember watching my mom open a jar and thinking, like, oh, my God, she's like a goddess. She's like, <laughs> I could never do that, you know? She, you know, just those kinds of things that we just think somehow that when we, we're going to be like Superman and Superwoman when we grow up, you know, and we can't wait to get there. And then we get there, and guess what? We're like a little kid in a, in a big person's body, you know? Nothing's really changed that much emotionally. But it can as we accept, as we become wise. So Madeline Lengel says, really, what it is to grow up is to accept vulnerability. That's the growing up. The third uh, myth is, I can go it alone. Anybody ever grabbed onto that one? That used to be a favorite of mine, the rugged individualist idea. Yes, we can do this. I still think, I always say this, but it's like very much in the, woven into the American spirit, isn't it? This idea of rugged individualism. We really praise this idea that we can, you know, climb the mountain, hit the peak, go to the next peak. You know, there's sort of that, that kind of sense of romanticizing that individualism. And yet we need each other. I mean, we are neurologically, socially, emotionally, hormonally wired to, to be social species. We need each other. We must, you know, this is the, the resurgence of the divine feminine. A big part of that is about the, the, just the hunger to collaborate, to belong, to connect. I mean, The Mask You Live In is a great example of, of that, that movie about young boys and young men being completely cut off from their emotional nature is a cry out for this, right? A cry for the feminine within all of us that, that connects, that collaborates, that is heart to heart and soul to soul. So another military story, and, and this is also the Air Force, um, D, Colonel Dee Dee Halfhill, this, this is told in the book Dare to Lead, that um, Colonel Dee Dee Halfhill was in charge of, one of her jobs was innovation and leadership development, and she had 33,000 troops that were a part of the program that she oversaw. One day she was meeting with maybe more like 60 of them, just a small group, and and they were, she was explaining some things, presenting some things, and, and one young man raised his hand and he said, ma'am, when are things going to, the tempo, they call it the ops tempo, when's it going to slow down a bit? We're really tired. I'm really tired. And then she said, yeah, I know, I keep hearing that. Everyone I talk to, every time I, I give a presentation, I hear about how tired everybody is. She said, how many, how many of you feel tired? Every, every hand flies up, you know. So there's this sense of just kind of collective exhaustion, right? And she just sort of off the cuff remembers this uh, Harvard Business Review article she just read about loneliness and how they had gone into these corporations that where people kept reporting how exhausted they were. And as they did the research, they found out they weren't tired. Well, they were tired, but it was on top of the reason why they were tired was because they felt lonely. And she asked, how many of you feel lonely, thinking maybe one person would be brave enough to raise their hand, and about 15 hands shot up. And then she didn't know what to do. And she felt vulnerable, right? Because what does she do with that? It's like, what do you do with it when everybody's telling you they feel lonely? And you know, if, as leaders, if they would have addressed the exhaustion amongst those folks in the military or in the corporation, what they would have said is take more time off, right? Take time away. Be by yourself. Go rest. That's not going to work if really what you're feeling is lonely. Right? What you need if you feel lonely is connection. What you need if you feel lonely is a sense that I, we're in this together. We have a sense of hope. We're working together toward the same mission. We miss families or whatever it may be and able to talk about that. So getting to the right words as a leader is really important. She said that was one of the main things she learned from this work, Dee Dee said, from doing this Dare to Lead work, was getting the right words is really important. She was working with another person who said, oh, right, I talk to the guys about being disconnected all the time. She said, why do you use that word? She said, that's so sterile. Why don't you say lonely? Lonely is what they feel. You can feel the difference, right? Yeah. Yeah. Disconnect is like a little bit, it's kind of getting there, but it's not really the feeling. The feeling is lonely. 
It's hard to admit because it's vulnerable, right? It feels vulnerable to say I'm lonely. And so putting that out there and then seeing what can we now do together really resolves the bottom line issue. This kind of bleeds into this, the next, um, the next uh, myth, which is you can engineer the uncertainty and discomfort out of vulnerability. So what Dee Dee did was, because she got really curious about this, because she went back and reread the leadership manual from 2011 for this Air Force group, or for the Air, the Air Force period. And, and one of the core values was humanness, but it didn't say anything about what humanness was. And so she was like, what do they mean by humanness? So she started digging around, and it took her all the way back to a manual from 1948 for the Air Force. Completely different kind of manual. In that manual, they break down humanness. She said they, said they talked about the importance of feeling 147 times in the manual. They talked about the sense of belonging 27 times. They used the word love 13 times. They used love and compassion and kindness and mercy and friendliness and fear. The 2011 manual, none of those words, just humanness. And the rest was about tactical operations, strategic operations. No wonder, no wonder we have problems, right? We have tried to engineer uncertainty and discomfort out of vulnerability. It's not possible. We can't write it out. <laughs> it's not possible. No wonder our boys and men are living in masks. No wonder our girls and women are living in masks. Because we've made it unsafe to be this way with each other, to be human with each other in our organizations, in our neighborhoods even, in our families even. We've made it not okay. So the engineering and, um, of this also really touches on this area in the tech industry, right? Because the tech industry really has, as part of their design, to, to, get, to engineer out the systemic vulnerability in terms of like not letting people hack into the systems, right? So it's more from an artificial intelligence and from a technology standpoint, you don't want systematic, systematic vulnerability in that way. You don't want your, your technology to be vulnerable. But it's easy to get that confused with relational vulnerability. <laughs> and so for those of you who work in tech or know people who work in tech, this might be sort of a foreign concept because you're so geared toward trying to keep the system safe that we begin to keep ourselves and our relationships so armored up that we're not really open to this, this, op this open-hearted way of being. And then the, the fifth myth is that trust become, comes before vulnerability. It's not really one or the other. It's like chicken and the egg, right? They just layer on top of each other. So it's like we trust somebody and we're more vulnerable with them. We start to become more vulnerable with somebody and they trust us more. You know, we start to be more vulnerable with ourselves and we trust ourselves more. We trust our spirit more. We trust the, the truth that comes forth more when we are more open in our prayers more. You know, if you start to have those sort of God is best friend kinds of prayers and just begin to kind of talk out what's going on for you or journal out what's happening, you begin to open up to some of those places where you might feel more vulnerable. So um, John Gottman is a researcher who um, wrote about some of his research and, and told this story on UC Berkeley's Greater Good website. And he says that one day he was reading a mystery novel. He was um, lying in bed, and he had to get up and go to the bathroom. But like, he didn't even want to stop right, to put it down because he, he thought he knew who the killer was, and he was at that part like toward the end of the novel. Anybody like get into novels, and you're getting close to the end, whether it's mystery or not, you want to know how the story ends. And you kind of have an idea in your mind of where it's going. And so he was in the, at that point, right, that critical point. So, oh, he's got to go to the bathroom. So he decides to leave his book there. And, he goes in the bathroom, and his wife is in the mirror brushing her hair, and she looks really sad. And he's like, oh, bummer. <laughs> so he's got to like make a choice, right? And he's a researcher, so he knows. He calls these sliding door moments. So he's got a sliding door moment, right? He can build more trust and connection with his wife right now, or he could go finish his novel. <laughs> and you know what he really wants to do, right? And so this is another choice point, right, in our relationships. Sometimes in the moment, we really want to do something different than what is being called for. I want empathy. What do you mean i got to give you empathy? Darn it. You know? 
<laughs> so we get in those, those kinds of, of moments. And so as leaders, it's really important that we are aware of that. You know, as leaders, it's as, as the prayer of St. Francis said, oh, Lord, grant that I may not so much seek to be understood as to understand. It's one of those choice moments. And so he chooses the right thing. He goes over, he takes a brush out of his wife's hand, he starts brushing her hair and asking her what's going on. Probably didn't take that long. Probably wasn't that big of a delay for what it is that he was up to and wanted to finish. But it builds trust. It's those simple moments, those little moments, time after time after time, that build trust, that layer up trust, that allow us then to be more, more vulnerable, and then we're more vulnerable and we get more trust, and then, you know, so on. So that's how the dance works there. So don't miss the small moments. And if you do, don't beat yourself up. It's okay. It's not like you have to hit every single moment. But when, you know, just check in and see, ah, oh, this is a moment. I could take a moment now. I read somewhere at one point that, you know, anytime somebody is calling our attention to something, it's a call for connection. You know, like, I, I know there's been times when I'm, like, working on my computer, and Brenly will say, oh, come look at this bird. And I had thought about it as a call for connection. But now I think of it differently. Ah, somebody is trying to, you know, Grace is trying to show me something she made at school. I'm going to drop what I'm doing and, and because it's a call for connection. And those are precious times, right? Those are precious moments that we don't want to miss, sliding door moments. So just start paying attention to the sliding door moments in your life and decide if you're going to stop and open that door, which is really this door, right? The door to your heart. And the sixth one is that vulnerability is disclosure. So a lot of times we get confused and think, oh, vulnerability is just about like sort of putting it all out there, right? But there has to be some boundaries, especially professional boundaries if we're talking about work environments. And, and really boundaries are good anyway, right? No matter what kind of relationship we're talking about. But it's, it's an art. It's an art finding where is the boundary for what I share? Does it just become sort of this blah or gossip or whatever it is if it's just full disclosure? Or is it more to a point? Why am I sharing and who am I sharing with? So when we're sitting in the seat of leader, what, uh, what, what is to the purpose? Am I sharing this? So it, you know, sharing some of your heart and some of your feelings and some of your concerns is connecting. But like laying it all out there sometimes is sort of just like, what do people do with that? You know, it's sort of uncomfortable. Not uncomfortable like I'm vulnerable, like uncomfortable like boundaries have been crossed and it just doesn't feel right. You know, so it's just finding, finding our way, you know. And the only way we find our way is to keep doing this stuff and making mistakes. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to, or whatever that's called, we're going to have times that we feel unskillful about what we have said or done. But that's all part of it, right? And we're not just leaders. Again, I want to remind you all, we're not talking about leaders like you lead an organization or you lead a team, but, but that you show up as a spiritual leader because you're a spiritual being on this journey. And so therefore, you're somebody who's practiced in entrusting what goes on inside of you, entrusting your own body, entrusting your innate wisdom, entrusting spirit to give you the words or the actions or what's next. And so that ability, that skill that is already woven into you makes you a spiritual citizen and that makes you a spiritual leader wherever you go as a neighbor, as a friend, as a mother or father or grandmother or grandfather or, you know, however it is that you show up, there is an opportunity to be a leader, to lead the way and debunking these myths and opening up the doors and making connection. And all of that is key to us healing what ails us as a society, whether it be loneliness that leads to suicide or, you know, the big stuff or just moments of connection that make us feel more solid in our relationships. So two tools that I want to leave you with to take in working with vulnerabilities. One is the one I've already mentioned, which is spirit, right? We've always got this prayer, meditation, ability to go within available to us that will give us whatever we need, whatever nuggets of wisdom, next steps, right action, right words. It's all there. Or what, or will reveal to us what's in the way, what what's happening there that that feels uncomfortable or or fearful for us that just needs some attention, some kindness, some love, some healing, so we can move through it. 
And the second thing is the square squad. This comes from Brene as well. If you um, want to create your square squad, all you do is um, make a little one inch square on a piece of paper and write all the names in there that you consider part of your square squad. Your square squad are the people whose opinions really matter. So, and, the, and to think about that, don't just throw all the names of your friends and family in automatically, but take a moment to really be with whose opinion really matters and who will call me up higher with integrity? Who will share with me in an honest way? Who loves me not in spite of my imperfections, but because of my imperfections? Who really knows you and cares about you? And wants you not to be necessarily in a role relationship, to, to be the very best of who you are. That's who goes in your square squad. So you may only have one or two names. And that's, that's the place you can go back to when you're unsure, when you want a little check from somebody, a, a, a god with skin on, so to speak. Um, you can go to the people in your square squad, and they'll tell you the truth. And they'll lift you up higher, and they'll help you through whatever it is that you're going through. So always have that little support team with you. You might cut it out in your one inch and keep it in your pocket or your wallet or whatever, so it's always with you. So the truth is that we are these spiritual leaders and that we do have the ability, as Brene would say, to rumble with vulnerability within our, ourselves and with each other, to lean into the difficult conversations, to move through these times. And that's really what is called for in our world from each of you, from each of us as a spiritual leader. So let's really know this together. Let's, let's close out just holding on to and lifting up this truth together that we are indeed spiritual leaders and we are uh, ones who can rumble with vulnerability. And when we do so, we, d we expose that divine magnificence that is waiting for us. Let's say it together. I am a spiritual leader who rumbles with vulnerability exposing divine magnificence, and so it is. Thank you.